Good evening, and welcome to the fourth and final installment of Jesus Christ and the Dividing Wall, Race and God's Mission. My name is Ralph Lowe, and I am a Master of Divinity student at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and a member of the conference planning team. And I work as a Director of Justice Ministries at the Pittsburgh Presbytery. And I'm Hunter Farrell with Pittsburgh Seminary's World Mission Initiative, where we train seminary students and mission leaders like yourselves to lead their people across lines of difference into the mission of Jesus Christ. On behalf of Pittsburgh Seminary's Continuing Education Program and the World Mission Initiative, we're pleased to welcome you tonight to this final session in our month-long series, which each week has garnered between 400 and 500 watch parties and individuals gathering together to listen and discuss and pray from 37 states in the United States and seven foreign countries. Once more, we thank our 61 sponsors without whom we could not have organized a conference of this scale. We're especially grateful to the generous contributors to the W. Dawn and Lida McClure endowed lecture in World Mission and evangelism, which sponsors this lecture each year. I just want to add two important notes for this evening. First, the workshops we will offer to the participants to continue the road to justice and reconciliation. We are including in this flipped conference six pre-recorded workshops on race and God's mission that churches, Sunday school classes, and small groups can use. Our, workshop, our workshops include Dr. Juan uh, Sarmiento, a tricultured church planter and Presbytery executive in Los Angeles, who will present how to shift our attention from mission trips to mission transformation. Ibrile Mizuere, a US mission leader originally from Rwanda, who will share reclaiming Christian faith in an age of deadly difference, based on her true life experience surviving the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. And the Reverend Dr. Patrice fowler Cersei, a Pittsburgh of Pittsburgh's East Liberty Presbyterian Church, will share her church's experience with community groups in their neighborhood. Tony Igwe, an urban missionary in Pittsburgh's Homewood community, and Hunter Farrell, reflect together on how to decolonize local churches' mission efforts. And of course, our national speakers, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil and Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hardgrove have each provided a workshop to, to build on their initial present presentations earlier this month. All six of these 40 minute workshops are accessible to you on the conference website and we and were created for adult Sunday school classes or Bible studies or for mission committee training. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, the second note is this, it's about our final evaluation for this series of conversations. We very much need your help to evaluate the experience and we'll be forwarding to you a link uh, tomorrow morning to a br very brief online survey. And we'd really appreciate your help in uh, getting your direct feedback. We promise not to sell or disclose your email addresses, um, but if you send us your evaluation in the next seven days, we'll enter you in a drawing to win one of our keynote speakers' latest books. Uh, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove's Reconstructing the Gospel, Brenda Salter McNeil's Roadmap to Reconciliation 2.0, or David Camp's The White Ally Toolkit work Workbook, Using Active Listening, Empathy, and Personal Storytelling to Promote Racial Equity. Thanks for helping us to learn how to improve this kind of a series. This is our first flipped conference. Friends, these conversations about racism and about white supremacy have been uncomfortable for many of us in our churches because they force us to look at what many have called America's original sin, the nation's historic legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, the continuing legacy of bias that results in significant inequities in our country today inequities in wealth, housing, education, incarceration, and even police violence. Our four-part conference is asking the question, how can Christians follow God into mission 
in a context of systemic racism where the church has often been either complicit or actively contributed to notions of white supremacy. We have been thrilled with the strong participation from many of you in the question and answer time following our keynote presentations. We again invite you to send your questions for our speaker using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Hunter and I will pose the questions to Dr. Kemp and I'll close our time at about 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. And you can all proceed to your small group discussions using the link that your local convener provided to you. And now it is my delight uh, to welcome a friend and colleague, Dr. David Kemp, who is considered a national expert in the areas of inclusion and equity uh, and cultural competence and intergroup dialogue. His insights about more inclusion and effective institutions and communities have been sought out by many groups all over the country. Dr. Kemp, welcome and we are honored to have you. You're muted, Dr. Kemp. Dr. Kemp, you're muted. Thank you. All right. Good to see you. Nice to be here. At a time when we're facing an election that is the most tense we've had in at least 150 years, it's time for the people of compassion to step up. At a time when people on the opposite sides of the political divide increasingly see each other as unintelligent, immoral, and dangerous to democracy, it's time for the people of compassion to step up. At a time when tensions around race, privilege, bias, and all of that deeply divide the nation so much that our enemies focus on them as a weakness to exploit, it is time for the people of compassion to step up. I wanna thank everybody involved in the extended family of the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary for making this happen. I want to thank Ralph. I want to thank Hunter. I want to thank uh, Lori, who uh, I've not met, but who must consider me the most high maintenance speaker ever. So I really appreciate not getting in my paperwork on time. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. My understanding that over the past few weeks, y'all have had some great lectures. My understanding is that for some of you, what you learned about racism has been mind blowing. And I suspect that for others of you, these lectures have not been as mind blowing, but they've confirmed things that you already knew. Perhaps you went to a higher level of energy because of the higher level of articulation and you have new energy about it to the task of being an ally. But the question in these kinds of situations is always, what should I do? This is the question in everybody's mind. What should we do with this information? So I don't have a complete answer to that question, but I do have an answer that I want to share with you and have you consider. This is a particular opportune time for me to talk to you because of the election. It was four years ago where I started a pro uh, It's an opportunity I'm talking to you now around the election because the project I think brought me to the attention of the seminary was started after the last election. Um, after the last election, I looked at the result as what might be called a pretty massive white ally fail. It was clear to me from that election, that there were not a sufficient amount of white people who are capable of having a reasonably open-hearted, honest conversation about with their neighbors, with their friends, with their mamas, with people they knew about the question of whether Mr. Trump's views were too racially problematic to elect him. So it was clear to me that white folks needed some better skills 
about have, how to have such conversations. So I started the project that year after the election, after I processed what might this result be about. Okay. So it is, it is, it is, it is an opportunity that I'm talking to you now. Since then, I've written several books, given scores of speeches, coached thousands of people in online workshops and in person about how to have better conversations about racism. I've learned a fair amount too. Uh, we've expanded to include other topics because people need coaching on other topics too. Racism is not the only issue that white folks have trouble talking about across divides of belief. So in addition to the White Ally Toolkit, my company, the Dialogue Company, has created something called the VOICE Project. VOICE stands for Voters Organized to Influence Critical Elections. In this project, we teach people compassion-based dialogue methods to help people have conversations across the voter-non-voter -voter divide, as well as the liberal-conservative divide. But it's my work on racial issues that brings me here today. So let's talk about that divide and how we feel we should deal with it. So listen, here's the bottom line. I'm a dialogue person, I try to stay out neutral ground, but I wanna to submit to you that there's a whole bunch of white folks with some extremely problematic views on racial issues and we need to deal with that directly. Uh, I wanna say a few of these, I wanna say what the view is and I will encourage you to pick, take a pause and you think about what is that number and I'll tell you what the number is. Okay, so uh, there's a portion of white people who think that uh, black people are basically um, lazier than white people. What portion is that? Portion is 23%. There's a portion of white people who think that black people are less intelligent than white people. What portion is that? 22%. There's portions of white people who think that white people are more prone to violence. What portion is that? 33%. There's a portion of white people who think that black people are less evolved than white people. You know how they, they show like the the um the fish, the, the 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 fish to the frog to the monkey to the Neanderthal to the person? Show that and then say, are black people less evolved than white people? What portion say that? 38%. So all of those are problems. And, and I should have been saying at least 38% because some scholars who study this think that people are actually underplaying their beliefs because it's so unacceptable to believe that. But as bad as those are, um, I think there's another number that I think is more to the point. And the question is this, what portion of white people think that the problem of racism against white people is just as big of a national problem as racism against people of color? The answer is 55%. I just want everybody to take that in. 55% of white folks think that racism against white people is just as big of a national problem as racism against people of color. Now, I will submit to you that as long as that is true, it's gonna be difficult for racial equity efforts to get off the ground. That's going to be hard to make anything happen of any kind of substance and impact as long as a little more than half of white people are in some level resistant to these efforts because they believe that the problem of racism against white people is just as big of a problem. So what I want to encourage us all to do is to take that on. Like bigotry is an issue, but I think that that issue is more important. Here's the good news about that problem. The good news about that problem is that given the portion of white folks who believe that, everybody in here probably knows some white folks who think like that. We all have an opportunity to attack that problem. Now, I want to be clear. I am not saying we need to forget 
our efforts around institutional change. I'm not saying we need to for, need to not go out and protest. I'm not saying we need to not do our political work to demand more of our leaders. What I am saying though, is that there's a whole domain of the work that is needed. And that is shifting white opinion about racism that virtually everybody can do, especially white people. Because of the nature of social segregation, white people know more white people. So I wanna submit that as we think about what am I gonna do about racism? We think maybe I need to start working on my mama or my cousin or my friend or my neighbor and work on them smartly work on them using best practices, work on them in a way that embodies the compassion that you think they might lack because they don't believe racism is a problem. So just as a term, as a point of terminology, um, it is useful for me, it has been useful for me to have a term to distinguish the 55% of white folks who think racism against white people is just as big of a problem as against people of color from the 45% who don't think that. And so the terminology I use is a term that I, I guess have coined called racism skeptics. The people who, in the, the people in the 55% are racism skeptics. They're skeptical in the view that racism against people of color is a bigger problem. And the other folks, I call the anti-racism ally. So that's just as proper terminology. But there's a reason for that terminology. And that is because I sometimes publicly say that the point of the, the point of the white ally toolkit is to shift that 55% number to 45%. And so it's very possible that skeptics hear me. And I want to use a term that's not that they won't find diminishing. I don't want to call them racism deniers. I don't want to call them racism minimizers. I don't want to call them racist. I want to call them racism skeptics. Of course, it includes a range of people. But I, that, just to let you know, that's what I will refer to those people as. So then the question becomes, how are people dealing with racism skeptics now? So, <clears throat> Think of, think of for yourself, right? Somebody you know expresses some viewpoint that lets you know that they, uh, they tend to minimize the impact of racism. What do you do with that? How do you respond to that? What, what happens right now? In our coaching of thousands of people and interacting online and uh, interacting in person, it seems to me there's broadly speaking, three types of responses. Some people, when somebody demonstrates that they have uh, views that are, might be racism minimizing or racist even, what they will do is get really upset on the inside and they will talk about it really intensely to the steering wheel or to their partner, or to people at home, or to people on the phone. I call these people scouts because they see a problem and then they go report it to other people with great detail and great emotion perhaps. So if they were in the anti-racism army, they'd be the scouts. That's what they do. It's about 40% of the people, 35, 40% of the people. People who come to uh, white ally trainings. Uh, there's another type of person who somebody says something racially problematic. They are energized. They're mad and they're energized and they let them know. They're not going to abide by that kind of thing in their presence. They let them know in no uncertain terms that what they said is some level of a problem. They go in full force often. They sometimes shame the people. They sometimes call them racist. They, some, they, they challenge them publicly. They sometimes make a scene out of it. They don't always do that, but they sometimes do that. that. That is their natural tendency. These people 
if they were an anti-racism army, I call those people. Oh my gosh. You lost me? No, we still have you. We still have you. Oh. Okay. We still have you. Oh, I see that was... Please continue. We still have you. That was the, that was a delayed text situation. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please continue. All right, all right, all right. I'm paying attention. All right. So those people, um, I call them the cavalry. Something happens and they go in. I also call them first responders because uh, something happens, they, they get energized, they respond, they may or may not have a plan, but they're going in anyway. That's also about 35%, 40% of people who come to, enter, to the uh, ally training. Those are, uh, those are lovely types. The intention is great. The fact that they get so upset when racism occurs in their presence is there's, there's something beautiful about that. But what we have to ask ourselves the question of is how effective is that? How effective is that in achieving the goal of changing people's minds? I will submit to you that the don't say anything strategy does not change a lot of minds. I will submit to you that the blasting people, it might make you feel good. You can, uh, as, a, as one of my participants said, self-righteousness can be a drug, a highly addictive drug. But the question would be, is it effective? I will submit to you that it rarely is effective. If you're that type of person, just ask yourself, I'll ask yourself the Dr. Phil question. How's that working out for you? Ask yourself that question. What I try to encourage people to do, if they're gonna be part of the anti-racism army, I try to encourage them to try to become more of a spy. Now, what do spies do? Spies know how to keep their mind on the long-term goal. Spies know how to contain their reaction. Spies know how to get curious and ask questions. They're behind enemy lines. They know how to do that. Spies look for strategic opportunities to influence people. I didn't even go even further. If you're a spy and you're deep by enemy lines, what you often have to do is to show people compassion because you are trying to have people trust you. So I want to suggest that if you're going to take on the problem of problematic white attitudes, it's important to know who you are and be honest about that, but you want to move towards trying to be a spy. Now, there's a little tool that I have developed. It's on whiteallytoolkit.com. Basically, it's, a, it's called the White Ally Quiz. If you go to whiteallytoolkit.com and go to the resources, you'll see the White Ally Quiz. It's a two-question uh, two instrument. Don't take it now, <laughs> but take it soon. Um, and you'll get a, uh, uh, you'll know what, what of six topologies, I just went through three. Uh, it's a little more refined on that instrument or what type you are. That's important to recognize. But, but in this topology, the hope is that people move towards consistently being a spy. Now, we have to ask ourselves a question, what is impeding that? What are the factors within us and within our society that impede the creation of more spies and create, uh, impede the um, appearance of more spy type of behavior in response to racism. There's a few factors I think is important to lift up. So one of them is th the problem of othering. Now, human beings are mammals who, who live in groups. So the problem of who is us and who is other, who belongs and who doesn't is a problem that mammals who live in groups have to address. We have to think about that and humans have to de deal with that. So that's a deeply ingrained issue that we have to struggle with. Here's what I would suggest that we all think about. I would suggest that the way that white supremacy has operated over the millennia in this country and has racialized otherness, has used a 
skin color marker to to make some people be accepted and other people and other people be other i would suggest to you that that what might that what that may have done for people on the butt end of that for people on the the lower privilege end of that is to make them more likely to question the whole structure, to question whether or not that's a good thing to do. Because we see the problems that it has caused us. But that goes the other way too. I also wonder, and I think you should wonder too, whether or not if you are, are not part of the group that has historically been on the top end of that, whether that way of thinking might make you more likely to make people into other even in service of diminishing othering. I'll say that in plain, in a plain way. Part of what I am struggling with and, and try to combat is the way that people who are allies turn racist, racism skeptics into other. There's a, there's a level of anger. There's a level of, I am not that, that I think is not only unproductive, it's unrealistic. So that othering is a key problem in that. And so we, what we all have to think about is whether the way that we do that in the anti-racism world is actually itself a function of white supremacy. I would say another thing that we have to think about that goes right along with that is what might be called the racist, non-racist binary. If you've read Robin D'Angelo's book, she, she talks about this. She developed, she helped develop my thinking, just reading her book about that. Essentially, the, the racist non racist binary is about the, the idea that like racist people are horrible, bad, morally reprehensible, awful people, whereas non racist people are good. They're, they're, um, they, they are completely free of the problem of racism. They're good hearted, they're smarter, they're good people. That dichotomy, the race and non-racist binary, I think is unproductive because it diminishes the degree to which white superiority thinking is part of everybody's training. Everybody's subject to it, including me. Hashtag, we all have the virus. So, Part of, I think, the next level of understanding and of work is to get past that, is to no longer look at people as non-racist or racist. Maybe actions are non-racist or racist, or maybe non-racist or anti-racist. But, I mean, whether actions are, but people, ugh, I don't think that's helpful because that binary, it lets us off the hook too much if we've deemed ourselves as non-racist or anti-racist. And it also casts uh, to forever beyond redemption to people who we have defined as racist. So that's the second problem. And the third problem, all these things all relate, is what might be called woker than thou culture. There's a culture, I believe, which is a sort of a um, extension or a part of what the conservatives complain about as cancel culture. Or, or complain about as uh, political correctness, there's a strain of behavior within the anti-racist movement where if you do anything that suggests you are still, your thinking or your actions are all affected by white supremacy, you are, if not cast aside, at least the level of aspersions cast on your character are pretty intense. You are othered. You are made, you are, you are made to feel like you, you are inherently problematic. All those three of those things, they relate to each other. And I think they contribute to people not interacting across the, I believe racism, I believe racism is real, I don't think it's real, divide in an effective manner. We need to look at the people across that divide. We need to interact with them from a stance of compassion, from a stance of hashtag, we all have the virus. Some of us are more asymptomatic than others, but we all have 
the virus. And so we need to not stop othering people as we try to lean in to coaching them forward. Now, I know time is going. I'm so grateful for this time. If I had more time, I would give y'all an extended lecture about the brain science that says when you want to influence people to certain things you should and didn't, shouldn't do. If, we, if I had more time, I would talk about things like the backfire effect, the idea that if you try to influence people with facts and concepts, not only are you not likely to change deeply held beliefs, you are likely to, in, to double, make them double down on their beliefs. If I had more time, I would talk about mirror neurons, a part of our brain that tries to match itself to what we think other people's brains are doing. That's why we laugh when other people laugh or cry when they cry. If I had more time, I would talk about empathetic reciprocity, the way that if you express empathy to somebody, then we're likely to express empathy to you, i.e. if you listen to somebody first, then we're likely to want to listen to you. But if I had more time, I'd talk at length about the power of story, but I ain't got time for that. But all of those things you can look up, you can learn about, and the point is to try to integrate those into your personal practice. All those things together come down, in my view, to two principles that we should remember when we're trying to influence somebody. One is we want to shift the conversation from facts and concepts to experiences. And second, we want to remember the ABC rule, which is agree before challenging. So those two principles together shift from facts and concepts to experiences, to stories about experiences, and the ABC rule lead to the core method at the heart of the YLI toolkit. And that's the race method, which I'll explain briefly. Race stands for reflect, ask, connect, expand. It's a conversational management strategy, which anybody can do. It's simple, but not easy. So here's how it works. Reflect means calm down. <laughs> you know you're going to be in a difficult conversation. Somebody says something problematic, you're going to lean into it. You're not going to avoid it. You're not going to confront it, but you're going to engage with compassion. First, calm down. Relax. Maybe rekindle your affection for the person or some compassion for them. And then remember, you're going to manage the conversation. You're not just going to react. Reflect. Ask. Ask questions. Lead with questions. Get curious. Not furious. Get curious. Find Ask some questions that shift their attention from their belief to the experiences behind the belief. Something that happened long ago, something that happened recently. But have a conversation about experiences. Connect. Here's where you try to, you try to deal with the person's beliefs. He says something racially problematic. You try to deal with them the way that I deal with trail mix. I try to get past the seeds. I can try to get past the fruit. What I'm looking for, I'm looking for the chocolate, right? You try to get rid of the things that you don't want to find something you can't agree with and agree with it. How? Through a story. You try to tell a story that conveys to them they're not completely ridiculous. There's something right in what they said. People don't like to be corrected, but they don't mind learning. So part of what your strategy is, is to manage the conversation in a way that you're going to invite them to new thinking, but not make them feel completely corrected. And the way you do that is to find some, is to connect with them through a story that shows that you have some alignment with their belief. And last, of course, there's expand. And that's where you tell them a story that tries to expand their thinking. In this case, you tell them a story that tries to convey that you think racism is still real. And you think racism is a bigger problem for people of color than it is for white people. Reflect, ask, connect, expand. So all of my books are based on this method. I had a video course called the Race Method 101 that's built, that's based on this method. You can learn this method. Simple but not easy, but it's useful to try it because it is about trying to structure a conversation 
on some level to almost if you do it, you are you are you are enacting compassion just by the fact that you did it. Okay. Let's talk about the principles behind it. Say a little bit about that. That method, even the sequence itself, is based on compassion, concession, and confession. Compassion. As I said, the first thing you do is to try to fill yourself up with some good-hearted feelings for the person as well as relaxing. That's important to do. Confession, I mean, sorry, concession. As I said, you want to agree with something in their belief. Now, one of the things, we have several ways we try to encourage people to find agreement with, within somebody's, somebody's something very problematic. There's different strategies we suggest. One of them is talking about racial progress. Um, we all have racial progress stories if we decide to tell them, although we're told by the anti-racism forces, especially on the left, that we should never concede that there's been progress. So I'm here to tell you, as an official Black person, it is OK to talk about domains of racial progress. But you ain't got to just believe me. John Lewis, rest, made, rest in power, I went with him on a congressional pilgrimage where he would go every year to take his congressional, to take his colleagues, went to civil rights sites. And uh, we were going to various sites. And at one, and then, you know, various people who joined that for a little bit. And at one of those stops, a young person was like, Mr. Lewis, um, you're so wonderful that you're here and teaching us, but isn't, aren't things really like the same as they used to be? Just, it just looks different. And so he, he smiled, he had kind of a wry smile. And then he said, um, well, I hear what you're saying. We have to look at those similarities and similarities. But here's one thing. The only thing that I find as irritating as white people who say there's no more progress to be made, as black folks who say there's been no progress. So here's what I'm telling you. It is OK to talk about domains of racial progress. And in fact, by making such a concession in the conversation, you, you de-otherize yourself. You, you make the other person you're talking to more likely to trust you because you're telling them that their perspective about racial issues is not completely ridiculous. And then finally, there's confession. Compassion, concession, confession. The best way to get somebody to believe that racism is real in the world is to tell them how it's real within you. Too often, allies think they're going to be persuaded on racism coming from this attitude. You know, there's racism in the world. And you know, buddy, there's racism within you. Me, I'm fine. That is not an inviting way of making a point to somebody. You're better off by going something like, you know, I sometimes find that even though I'm a good person, there's, I still have racially problematic, racist thoughts or, and feelings. And it seems like people are complaining about that. I guess other people have those too. Do you ever have that? You're in a whole different kind of conversation. So again, confession, compassion, concession, but the most important is confession. And what I find is, is that people are remarkably disinclined to own up to that. If we had more time, I would have given y'all like a little polling exercise, which I did with a whole bunch of Episcopalians two weeks ago. Let me tell you the result. So basically, I asked people three questions in a row. One question was, <clears throat> how often, how many times have you had racially problematic thoughts that you're not proud of? And there was a scale went from never to a couple times to a few times to several times to a lot of times. That was the that was the scale. And you know, most people were like, you know, th th and these are all people who are running anti-racist. Um, they're they're running anti-racism circles in their church. Um, I don't know I don't know what y'all are doing, but you should check out the Sacred Ground um, uh, program that the Episcopalians do. It's an awesome program. I know the woman who runs it, Katrina Brown. She you might have heard the movie Traces of the Trade. Her family's connected to slavery, slave trade, a long time ago. But her program is is fantastic. Okay, so these are people who are like not racism averse uh, to thinking about it. So the numbers on like how many people said a lot versus Nobody said, I've never had those thoughts. And most people said, I've had them a lot. Then I asked the question, how many times have you told somebody you consider an ally about those? And it's a slight shift to the smaller numbers. Uh, but people still talk about that. But then when I asked the question, how many times have you told a racism skeptic about that? Like the, it was a huge shift to smaller numbers. 
What does that mean? That means that people are not talking about their own racist feeling to the very people who need to hear about that because they don't believe racism is real. So there's a big disconnect in our behavior between what we want to do, which is to persuade the world that racism matters and they should do something about it. There's a disconnect between our what we what, what we want to do and what we are actually doing. We're not owning up to the fact that sometimes the racism in society affects me. So I want to suggest that the most important part of that whole race method concession, con crash and confession is the confession. And I'm not alone in that. Ibram Kendi says the heart of racism is denial and the heart of anti-racism is confession. So here's what this means, right? What this means is, is that everybody in here has the power to influence other people, a superpower perhaps. Everybody has that. Everybody has the power to reveal humbly their own struggles around bias. Everybody has the power of vulnerability. There's strength in your weakness. We don't look at it like that though. So I would encourage y'all to look at things anew and to take on this task of shifting white public opinion. And you ain't, you ain't gotta write books you can, talk, you can talk to the people that you know already. So my comrades have come on the screen. I think it is time for questions. I'm happy to take questions. Dr. Camp, thank you for that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions and some good questions. People are clearly interacting with the material that you're sharing with us. Let me go back though to earlier on in your presentation because you, you shifted gears and, and, and kept going. Um, because many of us were raised in a, maybe a PC culture, maybe um, uh, a fear-based culture where we feared the racism in us, we um, sublimated it, we tried to hide it. Um, you're saying that white superiority thinking has influenced us all. We all have the virus. That, that moves us past that binary uh, thinking right. that you mentioned. Unpack that a little bit for us. How is it that we all have the virus? Well, um, we all have it because we are all, our culture trains everybody to look at white people as superior in one with more or less, right? So I, as, as, illust as illustrative of what I'm talking about, in 1993, Jesse Jackson, you look it up, Jesse Jackson made a quote, I, can't, I don't have the quote exactly, but he basically said, there's nothing that makes me feel worse than being on a street at night, hearing people behind me and looking around and being relieved as white people. This is Jesse Jackson who said this in 1993. He, he is subject to white superiority thinking. The whole discussion that we have about internalized oppression, what is that? That's why that's that means that even people of color are subject to white superiority thinking. So I, I recognize that you know for some people it's harder for them to get in touch with it, but I would I would encourage people to look at um, to look at the possibility that what's going on with that is a certain level of denial. Now I'm not saying everybody is the same. So there are some parents who did a good job of raising people to not have that to try to fight the cultural forces that teach us all that black people are less capable, lazy, more criminally minded, et cetera. You get the, we get these messages from, how, from the media and from how society is actually structured. If you, if you uh, look at, let's look at racial segregation. You travel around your city, even as a kid, and you notice that the black people live in places where the houses are close together, the, the yards are, the, the houses are close together, they're more worn down. Um, they seem to be hanging out on the corner, not big, not big as much. It's not hard to believe. I guess those people are just like that. Well, now you got people who like put that out as, as um, in books as descriptions of how people are. But I'm just saying, you see that, you learn that, you have to fight against it. Maybe your parents teach you to fight against that, or maybe they just don't talk about it. When you bring up race, they get they get they get visibly nervous. You take that in. We're not supposed to talk about that. You are being trained the white superiority thinking. Hey, right, but, but again, it's not a slight on your parents. We all train on that, right? If we have more time, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell a quick story. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it really quickly. So last year, I was in Minneapolis. I was walking around, there's like the Sky Mall. Like the, there's like a, a, a series of, of bridges that connect the downtown area. So I'm, I'm walking 
like I'm, 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 this dude walks past me like this young guy who looks like kind of uh, looks Ethiopian, you know, the, all them Somali looking people in, in who, people from Somalia in Minneapolis. So he kind of walks by, I try to say hi to him, he doesn't really say hi, I look, I look, and he kind of has an empty backpack and, and okay, whatever, he just say hi. So I'm walking and I'm mean, at turn a corner and then I turn around for some reason and I notice the dude is walking in my same direction. So I'm like, why is this dude walking the same direction? So I walk a little further. I'm, all I'm trying to do is get my steps. I have nowhere to go. So I'm trying to turn it randomly. I make another turn and I see the dude is still behind me. So then I start thinking, why is a Somali terrorist following me? Like, what is what is up with him? Like, I, I, I basically turned him into somebody that I needed to avoid. So I decided I, I need to take evasive action. So I went to the side, I got my phone, and I want to let him go by. And you know what he's doing? He went by and then he turned into a luggage store where he had like a big greeting with the Somali looking guy who owned it, who clearly he bought his backpack to be fit. Now I criminalize this dude, right? No, no, no reason other than he's a black dude. If he had been not a Somali looking, what I criminalized him, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but race was a big factor in what I did. I'm subject to that thinking too, right? So my point is that we need to get past the idea that it's, it's too embarrassing to admit that. So, I mean, that was a great, that it, it was, it was great to define being racist as a social crime of a, a social faux pas of the capital crime order, but we need to make it more of a third degree misdemeanor if we're going to really deal with it. Wow. But by shifting, you just shifted on me. You, you told a story about yourself. And so you're exhibiting a little vulnerability that's helping me to hear you. I'm experiencing this even as you talk. Thank you for that. Yeah, that was, that was wonderful. And I got to tell you, Dr. Kemp, we're getting a, a lot of questions, a lot of how-to questions. So uh, I'm going to try to summarize a little bit of the questions that we're receiving because there, there's a number of them. Um, but can you suggest, this is a, a really popular one, can you suggest some ways to get curious and not furious and calm the situation down? And, and once you're there, uh, what are good questions to begin with and to solicit stories from someone about experiences for racial uh, differences? One of the things we try to teach people to do is to, away from the situation, like get to know their own relaxation methods. Like there are methods you can, the things you can do that are taught as like quick relaxation methods, you, you're taught as five minute ones, but people have learned to like do it four minutes and get some benefit, do three minutes, two minutes, and then a, a short enough time where you can do one on an extended bathroom trip. So if somebody says something racially problematic, and, say, and then you know that your thing is to do like, to close your eyes and go to your happiest place you've ever been, like you, you or whatever it is for you. So what, so my point is, is that um, one part of the reflect step is to learn what you can do to relax quickly, to increase your relaxation quickly. That's, that's one thing. Then second, I think that part of it is to remember to rekindle your compassion for the person. If it's somebody that you, a family member that you tend not to like, probably maybe because they're racist, you still probably knew them. You still probably some good memories you have with them. So remember that when you're going to relax, remember that, right? To throw yourself up with that. Um, asking questions. The core thing we try to do on the, on the asking questions is to you try to shift people from their belief to their experiences. So tell me, was a, that's really interesting that you think that um, people of color should stop complaining about the police because everybody knows you get treated well if you act right. Tell me about a time recently when you when you learned relearned that that was true. Or tell me when you first started thinking that. So, you, But basically, the point is to come up with some strategy to get them away from their belief to the experiences behind the belief. Because once you're, once you're talking experiences, you're in a whole different kind of conversation anyway. You, they're firing up your mirror neurons because they're telling you a story where we inherently like put ourselves in their position in the story. And it, 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 it gins up our empathy. So, and by getting them into telling stories about their experiences, um, you take some of the heat out of their, like, I got to persuade people to believe because now they're just, they're telling you a story. That's what I'm they still might be trying to persuade you, but it's a, it's a different, you diff, a different way of relating to what you're communicating when you're telling a story. And we're telling a story because somebody asked for that. Somebody's curious about you. Am I answering your question? Absolutely. That, that was perfect. And I think a lot of people got a lot of that out of that, that uh, answer. Uh, Dr. Farrell, I think you have a, a question. Yeah, I, I've got one here. Um, in our previous lectures, here's the here's the question, Dr. Camp. In our previous lectures, we've heard about the deep interentwinement of history and the development of racism and the theology and practices of the church. Yet we hear resistance to dealing with racism through the church because it's a political issue and we should separate church and state. What are your thoughts about this? How do you how do you see that? Me criminalizing that dude is not a political issue. 
So, you know, if, if you go at it with an attitude of confession, if that's, the, if that's the core thing you're trying to do, that's not a political issue. It's a, it's a, it's a different kind of an issue. So I, I, let, let me do it a different way. Um, <clears throat> so I think that the three, the, the whole racial divide comes down to really three questions. One question is, can you be racist without intending to, i.e., does unconscious bias exist, i.e., there's something called unearned racial privilege? Same, it's the same question, right? Second question is, do the racist structures of the past have any implication for our situation right now? And then the third question is, if there are any, if the answer to either the first two questions is yes, are there any moral implications of that? You have people all over the map on that. Like if you're anti-racist, you probably believe yes, yes, yes. But there's some people who think no, no, no. And there's some people who think yes, yes, and it's still no, because there's no moral implications of that. On some level, the divide is on those questions. I think, I think that the mistake has been for too long, people being anti-racist are focused on questions two and three. They focused on trying to persuade people that the structures of the past, that racism in the past affect structures now. And that becomes a data argument. And you can reject that. Or they focused on the third question, which is the, which is the moral argument. Because of the, the racism of the past, we need to do something about it as a moral imperative. We've neglected what's more persuasive, which is the first one, which is, is racism still alive today? And we and, and even arguing, can you be racist without tending to? And the best way of showing somebody that is to show how you are that. Then you're in a whole different kind of conversation. So I'm, I'm not diminishing the importance of those kind of institutional structural arguments. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to really make progress, the people who are resistant, you start out with, you know, sometimes I have these thoughts I'm not proud of. You ever have that? And then you build out from, well, if I have that and I'm a good person and you have that and you're a good person and you got these people complaining about people like us having that, maybe there's something going on as opposed to some other argument that's based on facts or based on moral imperatives. You get to that later, but you start out with people's experiences. Thank you. I, I really, I really enjoy that. What I really, what really stuck with me as you were speaking was how you moved away from it being political and politics to confession. I, I think for our Christian listeners, I, I think I need to raise that because so it, we so easily move into the realms of we can't talk about that because it's too political. But what, you, what you're asking of us now is to confess our own biases, our the things that make us vulnerable in this world, so we can so we can come to conversations in compassion, without it being political. And I think that's just a fantastic way uh, of approaching uh, these conversations in, in, in our divide. Um, yeah, the political conversations are about uh, thank you. Political conversations are about like what institutions should do, or what you should do, not who I am, and maybe what I should do. I think it's a better, you, you, you're better off getting, given the, the level of resistance you have to seeing the connection between the past and the present and the resistance you have to um, the whole moral imperative, you're better off starting with something that's right here, which is, how are we acting in those, are there, are there things that we're not proud of? That is so, that is so wonderful, uh, Dr. Kemp. I, I, Again, I, I'm thinking about in the, our lectionary for, for, for this week was uh, uh, Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew 25, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and there it is, you know, if you love yourself, you are, you are uh, agreeable to, to, to put yourself out there and understand your limitations. And if right. I can continue in that, with that compassion under, and, and, and relinquish myself in that way, what better love is there to show than to do right. that, right? right. Uh, so, so thank you for that so much. I really, sure. really appreciate sure. that. Uh, I do want, there, there are a lot of other questions. We only have about four minutes to go. So I, I wanted to give the floor to you to, to kind of summarize and may, maybe just bring- Oh, I, okay, I can do that. But you got, what's, what's the, what is the one, what is one question that's particularly good that might be useful for me to um, go on before I kind of close it out? Is there, is there any more? Yeah, I, I don't know, uh, Ralph. Do you do you have a, a last question or? So, so just as we move from this this space, right? As we um, um, this is the final night of our conference, and we've had some really wonderful, including yourself, wonderful, wonderful uh, presentations. 
I wonder, and this is for all, all my, our white brothers and sisters who are listening, how easy or hard is this truly for our lives? How can we apply it? How easy is, for, is it for us to apply it to our lives on a daily basis? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a task on our soul or is it something that we just have to learn to deal with and move forward in our lives? I guess that's a question I would like to ask. Well, I mean, so, okay, I got you. So here, here's what I would say. This year has, pre has presented us with many opportunities to bring up racial issues. You ain't, you ain't even gotta work hard. Like, let's, let's make, the, the fact is that deeply ingrained in white Americans is like, you don't talk about that. Some of it is because it's rude, some of it's because we're scared of talking about it because we might be obligated to do something, right? That's deeply ingrained as part of white culture. Well, between the protests, George Floyd murder itself, 26 million people were involved in protests, the uh, head of the government saying that um, white privileges is a racist notion and we're gonna prohibit the teaching of it. The, the attorney general saying no, this thing is systemic racism. Um, we have reason to talk about it now, right? That we've been gifted with reason to talk about it. So yes, there might be resistance, but it's, it is an issue in the public domain. Okay, so the question, to me, the question is, can we, do we want to step forward and do it? And I would argue that you wanna see it. You, you, we need to see these conversations as a spiritual growth opportunity and including like dealing with compassion with, you know, your, <laughs> with your racist cousin, right? If you're not, if you can't deal with compassion, that, that that's his views are issue, but that's also on you. You can think about why can't I do that? So it is hard, you know. I'm not saying it's not hard, but I'm just saying that part of what I'm trying to reframe is to get involved in the entries of movement. You don't got to read a whole bunch of books. You don't have to learn about the history of the church. You, I mean, that, that's all great if you do that. You can start right now with dealing with people right in your circle, and and just not over and and. Certainly not avoiding the conversation and maybe bringing it up, but doing so in a way that is purposefully inviting, which means that you're not trying to come at them with like some accusatory thing. You're trying to come at them like, you know, essentially, um, you're trying to gravitate toward the confession part. You don't start there as I, as I described, but you're trying to gravitate toward, you know, I think I, I have an issue and I think we might have an issue. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that yeah, that is beautiful. And I, Dr. Kim, I just want to thank you. And we are so grateful for your wisdom. And you challenge us with concrete ways to act uh, for racial justice. And, and we just thank you. So I want to thank right, you. I appreciate it. you. I mean, look, there, there have been people who die, white people who die for this, right? You know, we could name the names, right? Right. You know, Luso, James Reed. Mm. You ain't gonna do that. Just talk to your cousin. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all the participants uh, for the willingness to engage in a very difficult, but critical, critically important uh, topic uh, for our churches. Uh, sure. I also wanted to remind everyone um, of the upcoming uh, Shaft Lectures on November 20th, oh, I'm sorry, November 10th to the 12th. Acclaimed writer and theologian Sarah Coakley will be reflecting theologically on sin, racism, in the challenge of contemplation, a theological proposal. Before dismissing all of you to your local virtual watch parties, uh, which you should have received from your local convener, I invite us to just thank God for this time and let me uh, end with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, scripture tells us in Ephesians 2 that in, Christ, in Jesus Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. God, we know you delight in and love all people. We know this because of your son, Jesus Christ. So we stand in awe before you. We thank you for the voices from the world-class ambassadors of Christ. You have blessed us with this month. Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil, Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hargrove, and Dr. David Kemp, whose words inspired by Christ in the spirit have indeed put a lamp to our feet and a light unto our paths. 
as we move into our local groups and beyond this evening, grant us continued grace to follow your mission to eliminate the blight of systemic racism from our hearts, our communities, and our social and civil institutions. Fill our hearts with the love for you and our neighbor so that we may work with you in healing and seeking justice, righteousness, and peace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And thank all of you and have a blessed night. All right, Ralph.